Welcome to the Old Westbury Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's time for our Sabbath school study. Sorry for the delay, had a little technical difficulty, but we are up and running and we're glad you have chosen to join us today. We want to welcome all of our members here locally, as well as those joining us online. We're going to have a prayer and get right into our lesson, so let's bow our heads together this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath. We thank you for this beautiful morning here in Long Island that we can gather and study. Pray that you will bless us, be with us with the power of your Holy Spirit as we go through our lesson in Deuteronomy today. We ask this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. If you're watching online and do not have the material, you can go to our website at the Old Westbury Seventh-day Adventist Church and you can download the material and follow along. For those that have the lessons, enjoy. God bless. We're happy to have Elder Santiago here this morning leading us in our discussion. did your lesson. Um, this chapter of Deuteronomy as we're diving and unpacking and digging deep into the book of De Deuteronomy is one of the great chapters. I would say that there's some verses in here that we're going to talk about that really summarize and really encapsulate what the book of Deuteronomy is all about. And we talk about the words of Moses that he wrote down that was given to him by God. And this week's lesson really uh, touches upon those, those words. And the title of the lesson is Present Truth in Deuteronomy. So what we're, what we're attempting to do each week and what we want to keep focus on is how does the ancient book of Deuteronomy apply to us today? So in everything that we're talking about and everything we're discussing, the Bible verses that we read, we want to apply it to our life because the Word of God is living. It's powerful. Okay, it's not a dead book. The book of God, the Word of God is living and it's powerful. And there's always something relevant for us today. These things were written for our admonition because we are in the last days and we know that uh, we need the Bible and the truths that are find in it, found within it in order to continue to survive in these last days. Our memory text is taken <clears throat> from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 8, and it says, And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? And I like the way the King, the King James Version quotes it, and what nation is there so great? And that's what the, the, the quotation is, and that's the name of this week's lesson, for what nation is there so great? And you think about just that verse, and, and Moses talking to the children of Israel and asking them that rhetorical question, what nation is there so great? And we talk about greatness in terms of nations, and we think about our own country, and we think about... Um, you know, we are the richest country in terms of Fort Knox. We have more gold than any other nation in the, in the world. Uh, we talk about our territories. You, we talk about the great land of promise in America. We have Alaska, we have Hawaii, and we have colonies in the, um, in the Caribbean. And we think about what makes a nation great, and we think about the amount of land, the amount of gold, the amount of silver, the wealth of a nation, its military conquests, but none of those are mentioned when we're talking about Moses talking to the children of Israel. He dives into them and says, this is what makes you great. And it has nothing to do with the conquest and the amount of possessions that they had. And they had all that, but that's not what Mo Moses focuses in on. So we're going to dive into and do a brief summary of the whole lesson. Deuteronomy 4, 1-9 contains a study on God's law and the consequences of obeying it or rejecting it. God's law is holy, perfect, and wise. Can we add or change anything in the law to make it more perfect? And we see this happening, and we're going to talk about this um, as the lesson progresses, is God's law is perfect. You're not supposed to change it, you're not supposed to add to it, and you're not supposed to take away from it. Mm -hmm. The Ten Commandments, the, the Decalogue, His precepts, his, right, his righteous judgments, all there, written perfectly. There is nothing that needs to be added, there is nothing that needs to be taken away. And I oftentimes um, wonder, um, you know, th the, the degree of carefulness that the ancient Israelites had in terms of copying God's word over. When they were going to copy a scroll, there were only certain scribes that were allowed to do it. And they had to make sure that it was exactly copied over the exact way, that not one word, not one 
uh, syllable was left out when they copied um, any of the first five books of Moses. They were very, very careful to make sure that everything was copied exactly as it is. And we look at where God's word is today, and we certainly see it under attack, and we do know um, why it is so much under attack, because it's God's perfect um, will. It's a reflection of his character. So if you can't attack God's character directly, go after his law, because his law is a reflection of his character. And Satan well knows this. He's been doing this, and that's the whole essence of the great controversy, right? From the beginning of time, before the foundation of the world, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the devil and his angels, and he was cast out because there was this, this malignant um, tumor that was growing in heaven that was now starting to draw one-third of the angels away and probably would have drawn away more had he not been cast out of heaven. So we see that he was, right from the beginning, he's the father of lies, he told lies, he maligned God's name, he maligned God's character, he maligned God's law. He said it was imperfect. He said um, uh, it was too arbitrary, it was too capricious, it was too restrictive, and Satan sought to overthrow God's government. And this is the whole essence of the great controversy, and we see that playing itself out today in this world. How is the law related to wisdom? Can we get renowned in this life by obeying the law? These are some of the questions we're going to explore. We'll run through the lesson briefly. Sunday's lesson was entitled, Do Not Add or Take Away. Monday's lesson was entitled, Baal Pure. Tuesday's lesson was entitled, Cleave to the Lord Your God. Wednesday's lesson was entitled, For What Nation Is There So Great? And then Thursday's lesson was entitled, Your Wisdom and Your Understanding. And we're going to dive into that pretty, pretty deeply. Um, as we go through. I hope you studied your lesson, and again, if you have questions, those of you who are here or those of you online, post those questions, post those comments. Um, we'll do our best to answer them, and it's always a blessing to teach the lesson because as I teach, I also learn, and I enjoy the feedback and the interactive. Sabbath school is the one portion that we can be interactive, so we should always take advantage of that opportunity. Sunday's lesson is entitled, Do Not Add or Take Away. Deuteronomy 4, verse 2. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. These words are the, are the words of Moses speaking to the children of Israel. And they well knew and understood that anything added or taken away from the word of God was a grievous, grievous sin. Because again, the word of God is a reflection of his character, and to malign his word is to malign his character. Mm -hmm. To take away from it is to take away from his character. To add to it is to add to his perfect character. And that's why it's such a direct correlation when we look at that, God's perfect law. We would be taking God's place if we tried to make the law, the perfect law, even more perfect by adding or removing something from it. That was Satan's desire. His propaganda during his rebellion defended that the law was imperfect, so changing it was urgent. And this is how he was able to draw one-third of the angels. He sowed these seeds of doubt in the angels in terms of God's law and questioning God's law and what was written in it. Where else would you find in the Bible about adding or taking away from, from, from the words of the, from the commandments? Where else in the Bible, does anyone have a, a Bible verse that they can think of right off the top of your head that would talk about adding or taking away from the word of God? Revelation. Revelation, right? Revelation 22, verse 19. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Now we see that that's a, that's, if we're talking about your name being blotted out of the book of life, we're talking about plagues being put on you and you read the plagues that go on in Revelation, mm -hmm. that's some serious stuff. So right. we don't ever want to fall into that category of adding or taking away from the word of God. This is why we always have to be true to the word of God because it's, it's uh, his perfect will and his perfect character. Has his law been added to and taken away? Someone give me some examples. How has God's law been added to or taken away from the beginning of time, from the first time that Moses wrote, wrote, wrote them down, from the time of the first Ten Commandments being written on two tablets of stone? How has the word of God been, been changed or added it or edited or uh, deleted or uh, restarted in a way? Anyone have any, any comments on that in particular? Yes, Carmen. Let's just wait for the mic so that those online can 
Mo has one. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Yellow mic, please. Is it on? Just... It's on. It's on. Okay, yellow mic. Uh, in Colombia, my background uh, was Catholic. Mm -hmm. So we had to take the, 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 the Sunday, no, the Sabbath. And uh, it's a lot of things that the traditions that I didn't know. So I was based in the 1980s uh, when I started. Uh, reading into and studying the Bible, the difference. So I was so thankful about the person that introduced me to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yes, yeah, thank you for sharing that, Carmen. And, and, and any other former Catholics that might want to chime in? Or all the Bibles, <laughs> all the Bibles, every Bible that you read, or the Ten Commandments going to be exactly worded the same exact way and in the same order that they originally appeared? No, no. no why not? Why not? Uh, Elder Di Allen, yes. Yeah, it's a, they changed the Ten Commandments. So they took the Sabbath law out there and they replaced it. They, they took it out and they put it something up. Now that adding and taking away, did that take God by surprise? Oh, no. Did he, in fact, tell us that that would happen? Mm -hmm. Where did he tell us that would happen? Uh, Larry, I see your hand, yes. Yeah, I was just going to say that they... they took out the, the commandment about worshiping idols and split one, uh, one of the other commandments into two. The, I, I think it's the thou shalt not covet. Yes. Somehow they made that too. Um, so that's how they changed the law. Yes. Uh, um, and we do know that that was deliberate, deliberately done because if you can eliminate the bowing down and worshiping of idols, right, how is it that you can now pray to and give offerings to a statue of Mary or to Jesus or to any other um, graven image. Uh, yes, Pastor. Yeah, uh, Karen online said the Sabbath was changed. Yes, and, and interestingly about the Sabbath, when we talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls and they found some of the oldest versions that exist of the original Decalogue and they compared them to some of the other versions, there was only one distinct difference and it was only one word dealing with only one commandment. Does anybody know what that is? The word remember in the fourth commandment. Now you think about that, just that word alone being taken out. God said remember because he knew we would forget. So if you remove that word and you, you, you now toy with the fourth commandment, and we do know the importance what the fourth commandment is going to play in the last days, it's going to be the final test of those who worship God and those who are going to um, be part of the beast and the worship, the false system of worship. So. That one word, remember, taken out, we can just take out that one word. And this is why God, this is why Moses said to them, you shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it. You remove that word, remember, you get, you take the, the fourth commandment takes on a whole, almost like a different, different meaning. Yes, Pastor. You know, I appreciate what the author did this, uh, this day for this one. It says, you know, do not add or take away. I, I appreciate that he, you know, because we, we, we are quick and rightfully so to jump on the, the change of the Sabbath and the other things. But, you know, when you read this, you saw there's more than just the Sabbath and idolatry uh, or uh, the second commandment with idols and stuff. You know, it, adding to it, the children of Israel did a lot of adding to it, uh, things that we generally don't want to be associated with, but we as Adventists have to be careful in our zeal mm -hmm. to do right mm -hmm. that we don't add more to, to the word of God or to spirit of prophecy or make them say things they don't say and in order to try to be more holy or on the other hand try to be more holy with doing less things and so I appreciate that he brought out a, a, a balance and really didn't even touch about the Catholic changing <laughs> could see that I, I, I saw that was deliberate <laughs> yeah you know it's like uh, we as Adventists are quick on that one and like yes. I said it's true they did they changed it yeah. but we got to be careful that we don't miss how we can do the same Absolutely. thing in the examples he gave yeah and, and we use that only because it's the most blatant and the most egregious you know it's it's they make no mistake about changing it they even brag that it's their authority and their right to change it, right? Because he claims to be the vicar of Christ. And again, as I was just saying, 
This was not taken by surprise, Daniel 7, 25. And he, speaking of this little horn power, shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. That, that system of worship, that system of, of religion where uh, a person claims to be the vicar of Christ and has the authority to change God's word, we do know that that is, that is antichrist. We do know that. And, and, that's, and as the pastor was saying, yes, we're talking about present truth in the book of Deuteronomy, and we need to look at that and be self-reflective because just like the scribes and the Pharisees, how many rules and regulations did they have regarding keeping of the Sabbath? Right? A long, long list of do's and don'ts on the Sabbath that you won't find anywhere in the Bible. There was their own interpretation that they added. Uh, yes, Tony. Um, we, we understand about the, the, the Catholic Bible. Are, are, are all the Christian Bibles the same, like all the Protestant Bibles, or is there changes in some of them? Well, like I said, like in certain, certain versions, you will see that word remember taken out. They, they do not have it in there. And in, in terms of other aspects of it, um, different translations may use different wordings, but that's why you have the book of Deuteronomy. You have the book Deuteronomy, as we remember, we, we said, what is it? It's a repeating of the law, right? And, and when you read the Deuteronomy version as compared to the Exodus version, it's the same thing, but it worded differently, so that anything lost in translation will not actually be lost in translation. Why do we have four Gospels? Right? They're called synoptic gospels because they're from four different disciples, from different versions, from different viewpoints, from different experiences, but yet they all perfectly blend together and tell the story of Jesus' life. Yes, Pastor. Just to add to Anthony's comment and question, we do have to be careful because different translations do change uh, uh, meaning and content and text. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know that from doing Bible studies. NIV is not always easy to use yes. for uh, Bible studies. Uh, the Message Bible, you have to be careful. Yes. The paraphrase, you have to make sure there's some Bibles that are paraphrased Bibles. Yes. And they take liberties to change and things on there. So that's yeah. why, you know, try to stay with the New King James or the New American Standard. Those two are probably the, the safest ones being with the original. Because uh, selling Bibles is marketing. It's a very big mm -hmm you know marketing issue and you have to be careful because they're always coming up with new translations new things and so we do have to be careful on on that yeah. they're not as open as the catholic bible on the ten commandments but there are subtle changes you have to be careful right and god never said that it wouldn't be changed he said in fact that it would be changed that he would think to change times and laws it wasn't that it that god said that there's no way you can change his word you know the word is is quick it's powerful and his true word is going to last forever um and we look at that, and God's word has survived. And we saw that from the Dead Sea Scrolls. When the book of Isaiah was discovered, a complete scroll, as old as, as the ancient copy that they could possibly find, there was no differences from that scroll to the original version that we have in Isaiah. And, and that, to me, tells me that God's word is going to survive. Um, Jose, yes, I saw your hand. Uh, and then um, Ella. Hi. I just wanted to um, kind of follow up. Uh, and ask the question of what the pastor was just saying about, uh, you know, the Christians who have that zeal to look for extra mm. uh, information in other places. What would be the danger in uh, looking for, uh, for example, like the book of Enoch that is out there that's not in the Bible but mm -hmm. could be possibly considered part of it or the second book of Ezra and, you know, those kind of books. Like, yeah. what is the problem? Because it doesn't seem like those books really line up with the rest of the, the Bible. Right, and, and that's why they deliberately were left out because all of the books that were included in the Bible, they, they complement each other. How many times does Jesus quote the Old Testament? How many times does Peter quote the Old Testament? And then you see how different prophets um, speak about other books of the Bible. And when we talk about these apocryphal books, there's, there's, it, it just, they, they don't coincide you know, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. So when you see an apoc apocryphal group, book that does not coincide with the original word of God, it's easy to dismiss it because we can see that it doesn't, it doesn't blend and mesh and gel. And we talk about exactly what you were saying, Jose, that oftentimes in events is we like to major in the minors, right? We, we add to and we, we focus in on the minor things and really forget the more weightier matters of the law, which is love and, and loving God and loving each other and loving one another. Yes, Pastor. Uh, Carmen said here they uh, got away with changing the second commandment like we've been talking about, divided the 10th, and she shared her experience being raised uh, Romanian Orthodox. 
they were taught to pray to icons, uh, baby uh, Mary, baby Jesus, and things like this in the changing of the day. Yes. I, I, yes, I'm and sorry. And also okay. the fact that we should not have any other God. So confession of sins, we should confess our sins only to God and not to our, our not a fellow human being because their blood was not shed on, for us. Only Christ's blood was shed for the remission of our sins. Yes, yes, and that, this is why distorting or removing or adding from the word of God can, can lead to so much. You look at just those simple changes, how far people have drifted away from the original and true worship of the Lord that the PowerPoint talks about is Satan has induced the people of God to add new rules to the law through history. For example, by mixing truth with pagan customs, inventing new laws, and establishing traditions. And we oftentimes, we, we um, displace the word of God with human tradition, right? We, we develop them in our own households, in our own families. We have family traditions, we have cultural traditions, right? That we try to supplant the word of God with. And yet we have to understand that the word of God is, is the ultimate and true test that we're to compare what we do, why we do it. It's to the word and to the testimony, right? This is what we have to maintain that, that contact constantly. He even encouraged them to remove commandments like the second one in order to worship God through images. I like that illustration there because you see the second one just ripped out <laughs> right off the two tablets of stone. The tenth one was divided into two to make sure that there was still ten. Um, so we, 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 we see that and we know that and again, but we also have to remember that we have to be careful that we don't oftentimes, not as blatantly as that, but we oftentimes do either take away or add to the word of God. We have to be careful. Monday's lessons, Baal Peor. Someone briefly tell me what happened if you did your lesson. What, what, what is Baal Peor? What happened there? Give it to me in a, in a quick nutshell, if you did your lesson. If you didn't, then I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, you know what? Even better. <laughs> Even better. Let's go to the Word of God together, all right? Turn, turn in your books to, um, in, in your Bibles, to Numbers chapter 25, right? Numbers chapter 25, verse 1. And we're going to give the context of what happens here at Baal Peor. We're talking about Balak, the king of the, of the uh, Moabites, right? And we're talking about Balaam, the prophet of Israel. Now, Balak wants... His, he's the king of the Moabites, and he sees that Israel has now conquered surrounding nations. And he saw them out in the plain, in their tents, in vast numbers. As far as, they were like the sands of the, the, the sea, the, the sand on the seashore, right? In great multitude. And he knew there was no way he could conquer the nation of Israel because they were so plenteous, and God had given them victory over the surrounding nations. Now the king is now getting very nervous about the nation of Israel and he calls on Balaam to come in and curse the nation of Israel, right? We remember the story? Yeah. Three times he tries to curse the nation of Israel and three times they turned into blessing. And Balak was angry with Balaam and eventually says, don't even, don't bless or curse, just get out of my sight. <laughs> he had had enough. But Balak and through Satan, right, now hatches a different type of plan, okay? He now decides to use women, right? His Moabite women. And we pick this story up in, Gen in Numbers chapter 25, verse 1. Now Israel remained in the Acacia Grove, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. Um, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. Now I want to stop there, because I don't want you to miss a particular point there. You see there in verse 2, they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods. What was the first thing they did? They ate. They ate and then bowed down. We see the connection. We, talk, we oftentimes, as Adventists, we talk about the health message, right? What we put into our bodies affects us, mind, body, and spirit, right? We see the, the health message is the right arm of the gospel for this reason, because the people ate. What do you think they ate? Fruits and vegetables? Pulse? Um, you know, uh, veggie links. Uh, what, what did they? What do you think they ate? What do you picture them eating? Eating for the idol worship. Go ahead, Dion. The food they put it for the idols. They ate that food. Yeah, yeah. Um, I picture animals strangled, animals' flesh mingled with blood. Uh, food sacrificed to idols, food that was prayed over and, and dedicated to, to Baal, to their, to their uh, idol gods. How could Israel be in the camp, camping in the wilderness? They had just got victory over their enemies. They're about to conquer another nation. How could they 
fall so far so fast? How? Pastor. You know, like you said in verse 2, it says, they invited the people. Mm -hmm. You know, the, I, I, it, sometimes we, we have to be very careful because we are called to go and share the gospel. They were the chosen people, chosen nation. They were supposed to convert the people around them. But because they weren't right spiritually with God, which we get to the next day, this was something that they were easily swayed. You know, they came in, they said, oh, yes, let's work together. Look, how about we prepare the food for you guys? Hmm. And, and instead of being strong like Daniel, they became weak. And step one was eating wrong. And, you know, that's what we've been studying on yeah. the seven churches. Yeah. Each yes. one of these towns, they had, mm -hmm. had uh, appetite and passions, the two yeah. things that bring people down. Yeah, and then you, you picture an environment, drums, dancing, music, right? You, and we get the picture, just like in Daniel, in, Daniel, in Daniel's worship of the, of the image, right? As soon as you hear the music, you're to bow, bow down and worship to the graven image. The same thing is going to repeat it. Nothing in history is new, right? That which has been in the past will be in the future. The same type of environment will be created when we talk about the false system of worship again. Yes, Pastor. But no, just to add to that, though, you know, Satan doesn't have to come up with anything new with appetite and passion because mm. since the Garden of Eden until Christ's second coming, we have to wake up to that. It works when you're not connected with God every time. So yeah. he doesn't really have to change the game plan. It's like I know through appetite and passions every time I get them. Yeah, and you, you touched on that pretty well during one, one of your sermons. And I mean, you drew that correlation between the appetite and the sexuality that Satan's been studying us for 6,000 years. Right? Where did Adam fall? In appetite. When Christ came to the earth, what was the first temptation of Christ? Appetite. appetite. Turn that stone into bread, right? Satan knew. And so where Christ had to conquer was where Adam fell, was with, was with appetite. So we see that playing itself out and repeated over and over again. I don't want to read all the rest of the story, but you see how did Israel fall so far, so far and so fast? Who did, when you read on in the story, who did the Lord condemn the most? Who was to be hung and displayed out into the rising sun for all the nation to see? Who was it? Numbers 25, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord out in the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And when you read the book Patriarchs and Prophets, it was the leaders that led the people into sin. Right? How did they fall so fast, so quick? Because they were, they were led by the, the leaders of Israel. They were well-respected elders, maybe probably head of households, and God now condemned them because they had sinned publicly. They were now to be condemned publicly, and God put them as open shame. Cursed is everything that hangs from a tree, the Bible says, right? And that's why God chose that particular method of, of execution. Yes, Pastor. Just another interesting note in verses 14 and 15 you, of this story, you have where uh, Moses uh, specifically names the two mm. people that came in. And mm. if you look up those Hebrew names, Zimri mm -hmm. and Cosby, Zimri means music and Cosby means false. Mm. So when those two got together, created false music, which contribute to the problems that they were having there. And it was bold because like the lesson said, they walked right in front of Moses. They went right. And so we have to, you know, listen to what's being said here and be careful that today we don't allow false music because it's bold today to come right into our churches, into our families and into our homes to bring corruption and to bring us away spiritually. Yeah. And, and as the people were weeping, this person takes this Moabite woman and goes right into the tent with her, right in front of all the elders, right in front of Moses, like open, blatant sin. And we see that, and then there's that lesson for us. How does the church today deal with open sin? You know, do we condemn it or do we ignore it? And this is why God's anger was so, was so uh, kindled against them. But we see Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, who was the son of Aaron, the priest, he does the right thing. It was kind of brutal and it was kind of, you know, we kind of look, read these stories and we cringe sometimes, but yet God was pleased with what Phineas did because he said, your zeal has calmed my anger because God was ready to wipe them all out, but because Phineas was, was zealous about the, the house of the Lord and about protecting God's name and his character, he did what he did in, in, in defense of God. 
and God was well pleased and, and even blessed him and said, all your sons will now have peace. And then he put a blessing of peace upon Phineas for doing, doing the right thing. And that's a, um, a lesson for us as well. Trying to change the law has consequences and openly break only also has. We saw these, um, you know, do we read that whole story? It's pretty, pretty graphic and pretty um, hard what, what happens to them. But yet Moses in talking to them, your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor for the Lord your God has destroyed from among you all the men who followed Baal Peor. So all those men who um, worshiped, who had adultery and harlotry with these Midianite women, now doing these, these, these Moabite women, I'm sorry, now doing these unspeakable things, bowing down to idols and worshiping them? How? Nation of Israel bowing down to pagan gods? Who would even think of it? But yet you see that quick correlation and how fast, you know, they, they, we oftentimes call it backsliding, right? We don't call it back hopping or back jumping. It's a slow, steady, one cherished sin, right? Just slowly, 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 we start backsliding, backsliding, and backsliding. Before we know it, we're a thousand miles from where we used to be, right? Uh, yes, Elder. Yeah, it's uh, uh, because of their, what they did it, the scripture says uh, because the plague, it killed them almost 24,000 people. 24,000, yes. You know? Yeah. It's a lot of people, they did it over there. Even though God guided them, still they rejected it. And when God commanded them to go in and destroy the Moabites, who was included in that number? Yes, Balaam was included in that number. He died by the sword, just like he had predicted his own death. When you read it back a few chapters, he said, let me die that same death. And he was not only condemning himself because God told him, you will only speak the words that I put in your mouth, you know, and, and Balaam had no choice but to speak to what God told him to do. Um, I could really spend the whole, <laughs> the whole lesson on that, but we'll move on. Cleave to the Lord your God, but ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. So Moses says to them, look, this is what God did at Baal Peor. Remember what he did. He destroyed every last one of those men that committed fornication and harlotry with those, with those Moabite women. But look at the ones who cleave, who cleave to the Lord. Not one, every one of you is alive this day. That should alone tell you. And that word there, and the lesson talks about that word cleave unto the Lord. It's grasp, it's hold on to. Who does the cleaving? Does God cleave to you or do you cleave to God? Cleave to God. He doesn't force himself on you, right? You were supposed to cleave to God. Just, just like a man is supposed to cleave unto his wife, it's the same biblical principle. We are to latch on to God, be close to him, cling to him, um, um, use that way of accepting God and accepting him. He will never force himself on you. He wants to draw us close to him. He wants us to be close to him. And, and that's God's spirit constantly wooing and drawing us to him but yet we have to choose to cleave to him. That's what these people did. They chose to cleave to God. They could have chosen to play the harlot and sleep with these, with these um, probably very beautiful women decked out in gold and pearls and nice makeup and beautiful, you know, everything. And that's why these men fell so easily. Yes. Yes, we all want to be loved, to be seen, to, be, to fit in. And as long as we know that God loves us, we'll be able to cleave to him and then we will not be so desperate for attention, for, for approval, that we will turn to others, non-believers, and try to assimilate to their culture. Yes, yeah. And, and the New Testament says, draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Right? So we see that, that correlation. As God sees you drawing closer to him, he draws closer to you. If he sees you cleaving unto him, he will arm you and protect you. And that's exactly what he did with these with these uh, Israelites. About 24,000 people follow Baal. Moses introduces those who follow God instead. There's no middle ground. You can only father either, follow either God or the enemy. There's no, there's, we, we, we oftentimes we say, well, you know, everything is black and white and there's everything in between is gray. In the final days and in the final test, there's no gray area. There's no straddling the fence. There's no keeping one leg on one side and there's no Switzerland. All right, there's no playing neutral. <laughs> you are either on one side or you are on the other. And that the line, the demarcation, the line in the sand is going to be drawn so distinctly 
There's no mixing. You're either a sheep or you are a goat. You're either on the left or you are either on the right. There is no middle ground. There is no in between. There's no straddling them. There's no, or, or these people are neutral. There's no third category. It's either saved or lost. Yes, Pastor. And just to add to that, when probation closed, there's no second chance. Mm. And see, that's another danger that's out there today is you can yes. be in the middle or on this side or that side, don't worry, because there's a second chance. Hmm. And that's just as dangerous as being in the gray area or neutral. Yeah, and we read Matthew 24, and we say, oh, when I see that, that sign of the Son of Man appearing in the, in the clouds, when I see that small black cloud the size of a man's fist, maybe then I'll repent. That'll be my turn to say, oh, save me, Jesus, at the last minute. Oh, no, no, way too late for that. Jesus has now left the holy sanctuary. There's going to be a period of time where there is no more intercessor in heaven. And grievous times are going to come upon this earth when that happens. So there is, there's a judgment. Jesus says when he comes, his judgment has already been decided. God is able to keep us from falling, but we have to make the conscious choice, as did the faithful at Bel Pior, to cleave to God. If so, then we can be assured that whatever the temptation, we can remain faithful. For what nation is there so great? Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Oh, that if that would be said about us, if that would be said about the old Westbury Seventh-day Adventist Church, if that would be said about the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a denomination, if that would be said about Christianity, if that would be said about the United States of America, therefore, you know, he's, it, it, be careful to observe, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. And that's what our calling is. We're to be the light of the world. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth, right? We're supposed to, people are supposed to look at us, see a difference in us. We're supposed to be a peculiar people. We should dress differently. We should walk differently. We should talk differently. We should worship on the wrong day of the week, according to them, right? They should know that. They should see the things that go into our mouths and realize that we don't put unhealthy things into our bodies, right? Everything about that, because we, we would often say, and I think in a special way, it does, we, does, God does say that about us because we do know the statistics are there. Adventists live longer than the average person, do they not? That's a blessing, and, and surely the people are looking at that and studying that and wanting to know more about our health message. Yes, Pastor. Yeah, Sister Nova puts, God does, doesn't want us to be lukewarm Christians. Yes, there's no, the lukewarm is the, is the temperature that gets spewed out of his mouth. <laughs> and I'm sure the pastor's going to go into that when he, gets to, <laughs> when he gets to the church of Laodicea. Can't wait. According to this verse, when people say that Christians are wise, do people, when will people say that Christians are wise and understanding people? I love the way the Bible talks about, because um, we only see this in the nation of Israel. We see this only in the, in the time of Solomon. When Solomon took his reign in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 20. Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and rejoicing. So Solomon reigned over all the kingdoms from the river of the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, each man under his vine and, and his fig tree, from Dan as far as Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding. You see the two words there? Wisdom and great understanding. Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. And God gave it to, Moses, to Solomon more than anyone who had ever walked the face of the earth. So we see that thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. And men of all nations from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Oh, if that were to be said about us, that all the, the other denominations would come to the Seventh-day Adventist church and want to know more about our health message and everything, all the other Bible truths that we have. I'm so sorry I ran out of time. where We got stuck on a few things. But um, next week's lesson is entitled, uh, Lesson 7 will be Law and Grace. Uh, make sure you study for this week's lesson, and we'll pick it up again next week. God bless you. Continue to study.